Hi, it's Lisa Van Gammer. Welcome to this three-part series on adaptive giftedness and the power of the mind. What I hope to share in this series is how not to break your gifted kid. I think you're gonna enjoy it. It's a parent session that I've done and whether you're a parent or a teacher, I hope that you'll find it valuable. In this first section, I'll be looking at the child in their connection with themselves and their families. And so let's jump in. Now, you may have noticed that unlike an invitation to Hogwarts, when your child comes home with a letter saying that they were admitted into the gifted program in the school district, it doesn't come with any less startling information than the Dursleys had when they found out that Harry was a wizard who was going to go to this school. I mean, it's, but it's not like Hogwarts because there's no place that we send them where everybody's like, oh yeah, we totally got this. Like we know how to handle these kids. No, when you get an invitation to gifted land, it doesn't come with any further instructions, almost always. As soon as your suspicions have been confirmed through school or private testing, the fear sets in, right? Oh no, like what if I break my kid? Like this, I don't know what I'm doing. And I think that one of the reasons that we feel this way is because the portrayal of gifted kids and adults even in movies and other popular media could easily lead you to believe that if not parented and educated absolutely perfectly, a gifted child could end up absolutely squandering all of their intellect and potential and become a social outcast, unable to function in a world that is far better suited to more typical learners. So what I hope to do in this time that we have together is to share that even though we may wish that there were a Hogwarts that we could send our child to, Parenting and educating a gifted child need not cause anxiety. The premise that I have, and I've written this fully in an article that I will link in the description box below. The premise that I'm building on is the idea that if we can help gifted learners build connections with themselves, with their peers, with their parents, with their teachers, and with their community, then through building those connections, gifted children can become what I call adaptives. People who are, yes, qualitatively different from the norm, but who navigate both worlds with ease, who can handle being both a wizard and a muggle. So let's start with looking at the connection with the self. So when we're looking at a gifted child's connection with themselves, what we're asking them to do is to pay attention to who they are, who they have been in the past, and who they want to be. When gifted children are fully connected with themselves, they can lead really fulfilling lives. And in some ways, they're posited to gain even more from their experience with the world than a typical learner. And so we can harness that power and let them have an engaging and enriching experience. One researcher, one researcher said that for gifted kids, self-awareness, which is like paying attention to who you are, who you have been and who you want to be, can help you synchronize your behaviors and your actions and the events that happen to you so that you can coordinate meaningfully as a person who works toward a goal. So one of the things that we want to make sure we do is empower gifted youth to do this, to connect with themselves. Now, one of the things that we know about self-awareness is that it provides links. It provides links. It helps kids forge links with a more fulfilled and even exhilarating life that is rooted more in intrinsic reward than it is in extrinsic reward. So one of the things that connection with self relies on is specific techniques and thought processes that can minimize some of the difficulty that comes from one of the biggest struggles that gifted youth have, which is asynchronous development. The idea that they're not 
developing all of their skills and talents and their personality characteristics at the same rate. Even their cognitive characteristics can develop differently. So a child could be you know, way ahead in one content area and yet at or below grade level in another. And that is perhaps the greatest threat to their psychosocial well-being is that asynchrony because people hear them talk like a tiny adult but sometimes act like a child who would be considered immature. That asynchrony makes it difficult for other people, especially those who aren't familiar with giftedness, to make sense of the child. And when we can't make sense of something, we fear it. So it can cause a problem. In addition to asynchrony, I think the thing that I see that parents and teachers seem to struggle with the most with gifted children is gifted children's struggle with motivation, their own intrinsic and inherent motivation in always having everything be a constant battle, especially when it's regards to school, but it doesn't even have to be just limited to school. So the late and truly wonderful Ann Roper said this, that gifted children experience the enormous complexity of the world and add to this complexity by inventing and creating their own world. <laughs> so they have the onslaught of the world around them as well as the world inside of them. And it is particularly expansive for the gifted child. That's what, that's what Ann Roper said. I think it's such a powerful idea that, that they're like in the world, but not of the world, like spinning around two different, two different things going at the same time. Many times gifted children will either mentally or emotionally like recuse themselves from the world around them because of this dynamic. And that can lead to even greater social isolation, right? Um, separation from peers and from parents and from teachers causing problems in school when they're seen as tuning out. Sometimes what we think of as disdain for the process is actually just a desire to only have one thing going on at a time, right? Like I can handle the world around me or I can handle the world inside me but it's very difficult for me to handle them both simultaneously. One of the things that can help with this in order to help gifted children become more fully connected with themselves is the practice of mindfulness, which is the opposite of tuning out. Now, when I first started talking about mindfulness with parents, it, nobody had heard of it, right? Like I had heard of it from my best friend who's a therapist and uh, which, as you can imagine, how great that is to have a, a best friend who's a therapist. But she was the one who told me about it, and I was telling people about it, and no one had heard of it. But now, years later, it's become very common. In fact, you can find apps that deal with mindfulness. It's become a almost ubiquitous word. And I think one of the dangers of that, while it's good that people have heard of it, the danger of it is, be, is that it becomes overused. And when things become overused, then we sometimes no longer respect their power and their, the authenticity of, of the idea or the method. So mindfulness is actually a better method, this is my argument, that mindfulness is a better method for gifted students dealing with that duality of worlds that they inhabit than tuning out. Mindfulness has been described as paying attention on purpose. And it, although it arose from a Buddhist tradition, it's not inherently religious, so we don't need to fear it. Um, and the therapeutic technique of mindfulness is effective no matter what your faith tradition. So that's very helpful. Now what mindfulness is involved in is being fully present in the moment with intention, right? Like, you know, I am making a decision that I am going to invest myself in the moment as it exists right now. I'm not gonna be thinking about what's going to happen in, in 10 minutes or in an hour or tomorrow or in 500 years as the world is hurtling into space. I'm not gonna worry about that. I'm going to focus on observing what is happening or what I am seeing and I'm going to observe that without judgment. I'm not going to judge the feelings or the thoughts that arise in that moment. So for example, 
if a child is sitting in a classroom and begins to notice feelings of boredom, because right, it's a common issue with gifted kids, then oftentimes they will deliberately distance or distract themselves. That's their coping strategy, right? I notice I'm bored, so I'm just gonna tune out, okay? Mindfulness, on the other hand, would encourage the child to listen to what's being said, right? Okay, I'm, I, although I feel these feelings, I'm going to listen to what's being said. I'm going to take note of my reactions. Like I'm going to recognize them. I'm gonna honor them by recognizing them. And I'm going to observe how those reactions are being manifest, right? So I'm gonna recognize that I'm experiencing feelings of boredom and I'm going to consider in what ways is my body and my mind manifesting that, right? So not just, oh, I'm so bored, but they can consciously think something like, oh, the teacher is repeating the directions again, right? I know them already and I'm feeling anxious to get started. <laughs> I feel my heart racing a little bit. I wanna turn the paper over. My feet are tapping. My hands are getting sweaty. Now, the child makes no judgment about this. The child just observes that this is what's going on. The child doesn't add in thoughts like, why can't I be like everybody else? Or this class is so stupid. Or I hate that kid for asking again, right? Or why doesn't the teacher X, right? We leave the judgment aside. We just recognize and honor through awareness how we're feeling about the thing in the moment. Now, I have a picture of a teenager here because I think I could have put a picture of a 90 year old here and it would have still been true. I can observe without judgment. Who knew? Now, even though I teach about this, I struggle with it myself. It's a constant thing. It's something that takes effort and practice. You have to consciously think to yourself, all right, I'm feeling this. I need to make a choice of how I'm going to view it. Now, when the, the benefit of this, in addition to helping you manage right in that moment, is that when a child uses a technique like that to manage how they're feeling, then he or she is able to become a superior reporter of events. Because a child who's able to explain those thought processes to a teacher or a parent will likely have a better outcome in having that situation change than if all they reported was, I'm so bored in your class, right? And then the parent has nothing else to say to the teacher except, my kid is bored in your class, which is one of a teacher's least favorite things to hear, right? So if instead the child is able through mindfulness practice to convey a neutral description of the thoughts and feelings that they have during the experience, then they are more likely to be able to have that experience be more positive in the future, right? So for instance, in the, in the example I just gave, if a, if a child is able to convey to a teacher, like, you know, I start to feel a little bit of anxiety when I already understand what the directions are, but another kid wasn't paying attention, and so you have to explain it again. My hands start to sweat. Like, I understand that you do need to explain it to them again. I'm hoping that you'll understand that when that happens, and I do already know what to do, I, like, I start to feel my heart starts to race. I'm like, I get anxious about it and I'm wondering if it's okay if I go ahead and start if I know that I understand what the directions were so that the other kids can get the explanation they need and I can minimize the anxiety that I feel. That's going to be way more likely to get a positive reaction from a teacher than I'm so bored in your class, right? So ironically, the more the child pays attention to his or her own feelings and examining their reaction to what's going on, the less bored he or she feels. For example, even just giving the child guidance to notice five things during the course of the class in, that's going on in the environment will often give them something that their inner mind can engage with and then they feel less bored because it occupies their mind. So the practice of mindfulness may serve as a tool to help gifted children learn to be fully present in the moment and even in painful moments, right? Even in things that we're not necessarily enjoying, recognizing and acknowledging feelings and thoughts without being overwhelmed by them because they observe them 
without judgment or preconceived expectations of how they ought to feel, right? They no longer sit there thinking, oh, well, I was supposed to feel this, but instead I feel this, and then that disconnect causes distress. They don't feel that way anymore. So, pro tip, get some mindfulness training. There's lots of it available. Like I said, there are apps, there are lots of books, you can watch YouTube videos. There's mindfulness training available. If you have a counselor who you work with, they almost every counselor I know now has had some training in mindfulness or at least could direct you into the right place. So helpful tip number one, get some mindfulness training. The next idea I'd like to share is that gifted children can connect with themselves more effectively when they have the lexicon to express their feelings and to convey knowledge, right? If they have the words they need to share what they're thinking, they can connect more effectively with themselves. So while expansive vocabularies are one of the hallmarks of gifted children, parents and educators can help enrich specifically their psycho-emotional vocabulary. So they can help them explore the subtle nuances and connotations of words so that they can express exactly how they think and feel. If the only word they know is anger or frustrated, then it can make it harder for them to not only express themselves to other people, but to recognize themselves how they feel. And one of the things that is interesting about the research into this is that if you accurately label the feeling that you have, you can actually minimize negative emotion. So just by recognizing, I feel frustrated, it is mitigating to the feeling of frustration. So I interviewed Dr. Vidisha Patel, who was on the board of directors of SANG, which is Supporting the Emotional Needs of the Gifted at the time that I interviewed her. She was on the board and she recommended sharing what she called emotional adjectives with children. And she explained sometimes they have a limited vocabulary to explain what their mood or their emotion was maybe only three or four words. And if you think about how your child, either your student or your personal child, or maybe even a client, if you're a therapist, the words that they've used to describe their feelings, often there really are only three or four that are their go-to words. And one of the most important things we can do is to give them more words. Patel suggested helping them identify emotions by comparing words to weather. So a child may be asked, if your mood were the weather, right? Would it be windy? Would it be sunny? Would there be some clouds or no clouds? Would it be sunset or sunrise? Would it be stormy or calm, right? So the weather gives us lots of words that children are already familiar with. I just loved that tip from Dr. Patel. So helpful tip number two is to get some vocabulary. Next, Often the learning of a world language, even at a young age, is helpful because children gain more than one way to express their thoughts to others as well as themselves. So in many ways, becoming an adaptive gifted child is like a form of bilingualism. And the acquisition of a language different from one's native language may help gifted children understand a way that it is possible to successfully coexist in more than one experience, right? So they kind of get a double benefit from this. They might actually learn some words because some languages have different words for things than we have. Some languages have words that we don't have in English. And so they get that word, but also they understand that you get almost another life and that you can switch in language and when they learn to switch from one language to another, then they also learn that maybe I can do the same thing in my social culture as, as well as my linguistic culture. So the next tip is to get another language. Now, I'm not saying that a child has to become fluent, although I, I've written about, um, I've published articles on the benefits of learning a foreign language. I'll link that article in the description box below. But uh, it's not just that, even if you just have a few words, right? Learn some of the feeling words in other languages, especially those that don't exist in English, can be helpful. The next thing is that children of high ability have to understand that even though giftedness does signal high ability, turning that ability into achievement is 
not that simple, right? You, it, there's not one-to-one -one correspondence between ability and achievement, as we all know. So you have to acquire other attributes as well. Um, and some of that goes along with Dweck's work in mindset, which I, I've heard people recently diss it, and I've, I've read what she said about how it's been misapplied. But I think if we go back to her original ideas about mindset, read her book on mindset, and read the ideas about even just the fundamental premise of the belief that if I work at something, I can get better at it. And just who I am straight out of the box, like it's not like some kind of YouTube unboxing video where then that's what you've got, right? That we all can work with stuff. So one of the important attributes that I think gifted kids often need to develop is stamina. So like Duckworth and other researchers have called it grit, but which they describe as perseverance and passion in pursuit of a long-term goal. I think that that is essential to gifted kids because what I've noticed is that what Duckworth said, that this is what Duckworth said in one of the grit studies. She said that they, that the researchers through their research on this felt that it was important that children be encouraged to not only work with intensity, but also with stamina. In particular, we should prepare youth to anticipate failure and misfortune and point out that excellence in any endeavor, in any discipline, requires years and years of time on task. So one of the things I've noticed about gifted kids, and probably you have too, is that they're a lot better at intensity than they are at stamina. And so this is, even though it can be difficult for them to develop the stamina, I think it is actually good news for gifted kids because if gifted, gifted kids can buy into the idea that if they do work hard, they can get better at something, I think that they can more easily separate their giftedness from their core identity. And I think a lot of gifted kids get discouraged because their, their core identity is so tied in with their intellectual ability that then it gives rise to risk avoidance, perfectionism, imposter syndrome, right, all of those negative things. But if we can recognize, no matter how smart I came out of the box, I'm still gonna have to work hard like everybody else, right? Um, if they understand that success in any endeavor is the combined result of ability and hard work, that they are interdependent, then they're less likely to perceive failure in a domain or endeavor as a sign of a lack of ability because they recognize there's more to being successful than simply native talent. Part of developing this in kids is strategies for handling discouragement and failure, both of which are essential for self-awareness. So encouraging children to share when they're feeling like they have failed at something and to help them unpack that in a sustaining and encouraging way, not dismissing their concerns, not saying, well, you shouldn't feel like a failure over that, not doing that, but rather listening to what they're saying and helping them understand where this failure fits in the larger overarching arc that is, that is their life. One of the, my favorite tools for this is the keeping of a journal when they keep a journal and if they're too young to write themselves then maybe they can dictate to a parent that can enable them to see the ebb and flow of challenge success failure when they look back over their journal and say you know, today was a good day today was hard today was good today was hard when they see that there are going to be ups and downs it can be very beneficial we as adults can help them avoid that negative self-talk of I'm always terrible at this, or this never goes well for me by keeping a journal. Now, to help with this, parents can engage in debriefing of a discouraging episode, helping the child see the strengths that he or she has that they might be able to use next time to increase the odds of a successful next attempt, right? So for instance, if my child has taken a math test and not done well on it and they come home and they're discouraged and thinking oh I'm not any good at math I'm never any good at math I always do bad at math right then what what we can do is say hmm I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm wondering if some of the skills you have in reading 
could help you next time in math. Like, since math is its own language, like, as long, if you understand the problem well, it seems like your reading skill might help you. Do you think your reading skill might help you? Or how do you think your reading skill might help you? Or, um, like, your willingness to try something more than one way. Or whatever, right? Thinking of a strength that the child has, even if it's an emerging strength, but thinking of a strength that they have that they might be able to apply to the same scenario the next time. And then having that, them incorporate that into their journal, right? So in your journal, write about what happened to you here and write about what strengths you have that you can try next time you encounter a similar challenge. What, one of the things that goes along with this is research, research that's been done on soldiers that have experienced post-traumatic stress disorder. It indicates that when we recall memories, and, and this is interesting because when this research first came out over 10 years ago, it was new, and now it's very well accepted that this is the case, that when you recall memories, you, abs you actually are reforming them. So you don't experience the same thing twice in your memory the same way that you are remolding, remodeling that memory every time you bring it up and talk about it. So you actually add or delete details and emotions associated with that memory. So as adults helping children revisit challenging situations, now I'm talking about challenging incidents. I'm not talking about traumatic, like capital T trauma incidents, right? For that, you, I would strongly suggest seeking professional help with that. But a child who's had a challenging experience or a distressing experience or a lowercase t traumatic experience may be able to reconsolidate that memory by talking about it with a parent and incorporating the feelings of acceptance and resolve and encouragement and belief that the parent is sharing then the child then can incorporate that in the reformation and remodeling of that memory. Reading stories of, or telling stories, sharing stories of people that the child admires who may have had similar struggles can also lead to an understanding that it is acceptable to fail and it's part of the achievement process. Now, that idea is abhorrent to many gifted children, but it is indeed true. And the more that we as adults share our own struggles and how we are working to overcome them, the more that we work to remodel and reconsolidate our own difficult memories, the more likely we will be to be able to support the children in our lives, whether they are our own personal children or whether they are our students. So I'm going to stop here and I'm this is going to be the end of part one, and hopefully you will be interested in seeing part two, where I will start off with connection with their peers. So we've looked at connection with themselves and some of how parents and adults in their lives fit into that, but now we're going to look at connection with their peers in part two.